turns out there are in fact unicorns and they're in Africa. This is a photograph of one. It's an animal called the okapi. The images were captured by a motion triggered camera in Virunga National Park, deep in the jungles of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is the first photograph ever of the animal in the wild. Here's a bit more of a glamour shot uh, from a zoo. And while it has two horns, and you can sort of see that on the photo, uh, from the side, if you see the animal side on, it looks like it has one horn, which is why it was uh, confused with the mythical creature of the unicorn, and it was rare and elusive, and they are rare. Um, but there are also other unicorns that are not as rare. And as of January this year, there were a thousand of them around the world at startup companies worth more than a billion dollars. And within that group, 51% uh, of them come from the United States, 17% of them from India, uh, sorry, 17% from China and 6% from India. And one in five of those companies are fintech companies. Uh, six years ago, there were none from the continent of Africa. There's now nine. So while it represents a very small percentage of the overall wealth of startup companies, what I think is both encouraging and interesting is that uh, companies are being formed that are now worth well more than a billion bucks coming from the continent. But not all of them are from the continent. Some of them are from African diasporans. And in fact, uh, Chupacash is one such of those with an expat from Uganda and Ghana together in San Francisco. Uh, and Della is a global network uh, for, for talent, for engineers, uh, Opay is a company uh, that helps people do more with their money by providing smart financial services. Uh, that's an African company, but it was founded by a Chinese person in Africa. Uh, Wave is a US and Senegal based company, mobile money provider. Uh, Flutter Wave is another fintech company in Africa with payment uh, structures for global merchants. Uh, Interswitch is another one, which is a digital payments company. Uh, Asusa um, is uh, started by, did I say that wrong? All right. That's fine, good. So this is a, uh, a, again, a company started by Africans, but it's based in the US and it services the US market. Uh, but I think it's fair to count it still as a, in the African uh, tick column, what do you reckon? Uh, Jamia, again, a Nigerian uh, company. Now, currently, with the downturn in uh, the stock prices at the moment, I checked it today, it's worth 737 uh, million US because the stock price has fallen. But if we're in Australia and you think about the US Australian conversion, that's still over a billion dollars Australian, so they can stay on the list. Eh? Fori is an Egyptian company, again, providing payment services. So, across this group, of, of nine, while 21% are fintech uh, globally, it's almost 100% of them are fintech coming from Africa. And I think there's uh, reasons for that that are, are fairly obvious in terms of uh, the identification of a need, uh, particularly around the transfer of money, people uh, without access to banking, and the, the burden and costs of that, and then the ability of companies to act swiftly and uh, sit within a regulatory environment where these, things, where these things can work. So I want to talk now uh, and tell you two stories. They're personal stories, and they're about companies uh, that I've uh, begun myself. And I'm picking the first one because I did it as a diasporan Australian when I was living in the United States. So while I am uh, not part of the African diaspora. I lived for 20 years as a person in a diaspora in another country. And uh, I want to tell the story because I think it will connect with some of you in terms of the opportunities that you're thinking about yourselves. So this is uh, early, about 2001. Uh, I had just come off of another company, which was a dot-com company, uh, and that exploded dramatically in the dot-bomb era. And uh, 
I was looking for what to do next. And I read an, an article in the paper about chefs who were starting to boycott a fish called a Chilean sea bass. Uh, in Australia, we, we know of that fish as the uh, Patagonian toothfish, and there was a, an issue with poaching uh, of it in southern waters and a lot of illegal trade and people were worried about this fish and so a group of ethical chefs got together and said we are no longer going to serve this fish in our restaurants and i read the story and i thought oh that's an interesting stand to take one ethical they're by their principles and they're going to be in a bit of a problem because everybody loved chilean sea bass and so i thought as an australian living in america i wonder if we've got a fish in australia that we could get from there that would make the chefs happy in that it would be ethically sourced and sustainable because that's why they were stopped selling the other one and then secondly could it be a substitute on the menu for the chilean sea bass and it turns out we do have one it's a fish called the barramundi and so i had never been in the fish business before i said to myself uh, and to my wife barbara um, how hard can that be uh, the answer to that question is always actually very hard um, every time i've asked in my life the answer is all, i've always started out when i first said it like oh, how hard can that be and then afterwards I realized, oh yeah the answer was really hard but we started down the journey and we identified uh, a fish farmer in australia who was uh, producing this fish in a in a sustainable way the quality of the fish was great and so we embarked on selling it in, into the US. I remember the first shipment we bought was at the Aussie dollar was at 48 cents and the profit margin was good and the chefs just snapped us up. We then had a marketing campaign. We got it on Good Morning America. We had it in, in competitions. We created a whole um, structure around chefs competing, using the fish to win a trip to Australia and, and away it went. Now, the company went really well until the Aussie dollar got to 78 cents. Uh, and actually, from the day we started the company, the Aussie dollar never went down. It just went up and up and up and up until finally there was a cliff effect and we could no longer afford to import the fish and sell it at a price that people in the States were buying it, buying it for. Uh, sadly, also, the, we had one sourced farmer that we bought this from in the Northern Territory and they had a major fish kill in their aquaculture system and they went out of business for a year, uh, which then made it really hard because that was the only place we were buying our fish. But I, I tell this story because I read something in the paper and saw an opportunity and then was willing to take a risk to address that opportunity and then to find a way to create value. And I'll come back to that. So 20 something years later, uh, uh, my wife Barbara and I have now uh, bought a farm. We live in Brunswick Junction. I've driven up from there today. You're all invited to come and visit us. And when we bought the farm, uh, there were activities already on there. It had cows, uh, there was a dairy that was uh, unused. Um, there were other things that we thought, well, what are we going to do on the farm? What's the opportunity for us? And I had uh, read again in an article somewhere that Western Australia was importing 35,000 tonnes of cheese a year from the Eastern States. That's not even counting cheese from, cheese from Europe. So effectively, we made almost zero cheese in WA. And so when we were looking at what we had, we thought, well, I don't really want to, at uh, age 63, start to learn how to milk a cow and get up at 3 a.m. every morning and evening and do this every day of the year. Uh, but I was still was excited that we were in dairy country. So we decided to turn our uh, dairy into a cheese factory. And so this is the photo uh, from today um, when we took this. Now, again, there was opportunity. Now, you could ask that question a different way, you can say, wow, there's 35,000 tonnes of cheese imported, we've got cows here, we've got milk, what's wrong? Um, we didn't ask that question and say, well, then there must be a reason why people aren't making cheese, so maybe we shouldn't do it. 
we asked, we looked at it a different way and said, oh, here's an opportunity. There's about seven or eight artisanal cheesemakers in WA for a population of two million. Surely there's room for one more. And so we had a sense of confidence. We took the risk and we converted the, uh, the old dairy. Instead of milk going out, milk is now gonna, gonna come in and we're getting ready to launch that in about a month or so. And besides, uh, cheesemakers are blessed. <laughs> We're going to hear uh, in a few minutes when I finish uh, another story about the African diaspora and opportunity and understanding it. I'm only going to mention it in the same context that I've just talked about these two opportunities. A group of people who saw a need and an opportunity and have then taken a risk to create some value around that. And so rather than uh, jump into it, I'll just leave that there for a second. But this leads me then to the last couple of points that I want to make in my, in my opening remarks, and then I look forward to the conversation in a little while. Uh, we're talking about entrepreneurs, we're talking about uh, expats, and the question is, are you born or made? Are you born or made? There was a paper uh, not so long ago in the Harvard Business Review uh, that says someone who sees an opportunity to create value and is willing to take a risk to capitalize on that opportunity. Some elements of this are opportunity spotting, risk taking, and value creation. And for me, me, they are the three legs of the stool of an entrepreneur. But do you just sort of arrive there with that skill set or that way of thinking about the world? Or is it something that can be learned and taught? So Murdoch University has an undergraduate degree in entrepreneurship and innovation. So I guess from Murdoch's perspective, the answer is yes, you can teach it because we've got a degree in it. And my uh, thanks to uh, Vesna Sampson and Simon Manet for these next two slides. And this, this outlines the student journey at Murdoch University in the undergraduate degree, uh, looking at entrepreneurship. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of elements of it looking at the innovators mindset, uh, entrepreneurial finance, stand and deliver, which is about marketing and presentation, and then a culture of innovation and how you develop that. Uh, and you'll notice, interestingly, with these various um, courses that are listed there, you see, well, don't they look like the SDGs, the symbols of the sustainable development goals? And indeed, they are. And we've done the work at Murdoch University, and I'm very proud of uh, Simon and Vesna for, for developing this. They've mapped the entire degree against the SDGs and said, if you're taking this course, this is how you can contribute to the goals that all of us have agreed to. So I think what I would say is that entrepreneurs are actually born and made because there's an innate, um, attribute which says when you spot an opportunity, you think, how can I get in there, take a risk and create some value? And I don't think you teach that. I think people sort of either have that or they, they don't have that. What you do teach and what you can make is to make the entrepreneurs successful. Because just because you see an opportunity and you take the risk doesn't mean it's gonna work out well for you. In fact, a lot of time it doesn't. So the education and qualifications around this, and then I'll finish with my, my last thought, are really about helping people acquire wisdom ahead of time. One way to get wisdom is have experience and learn from it. Um, and the older you get, the more you get. Uh, the quip is, what's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Does anyone know what the difference between knowledge and wisdom is? Yeah. So knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing that you don't put it in fruit salad. <laughs> so with the, with the degree, it's about imparting wisdom, the wisdom of others, so you don't have to go through the, the pain of it yourself, and then to be equipped with understanding about nimbleness, creation of strong tr strategic alliances, partnerships, how to raise money, how to do a good deal, all the things that sit around the impulse to say, there's an opportunity, I wanna go for it. What I'm excited about now 
is we've been for the last six months having a conversation with the APA, which has grown out of our experience of the third commission and looking at all of these areas and this opportunity. And the APA is saying, well, we'd like to take a risk in developing companies. Can you help us do that? Can you help us uh, design a program of advanced study uh, to help us who are born entrepreneurs to be made successful. And I'm pleased to say that we're well advanced in that program now. We are taking the undergraduate degree and morphing it into a graduate certificate. And we've been on this journey now with members of the APA for quite a while. And thank you to those in the room here and online who have contributed their insights and thoughts. And we're coalescing those and we're now going through the process of the approval of that graduate certificate in entrepreneurship, which is our intention, should we get all the approvals done, uh, launch that for 2023. And for me personally, that is the most gratifying conclusion and beginning to the work of the Third Commission over the last three years. Because if, if there's one thing that has struck me at the end of it is that the solution to the challenges and the problems are the people of Africa who are both on the continent and in the diaspora who see an opportunity and want to take the risk and create some value. And then maybe in a couple of years, it'll be your logo right here amongst the Unicorn Club. Thank you very much.